amen to that. So good to see you. So glad to be with you this morning, those joining here in person, those joining us online. Grateful that you're with us as well. That's an incredible thing to think about, incredible truth, that nothing indeed compares to the promise we have in God through Christ, empowered by His Spirit. In this series, we've been talking about these promises, what they look like in the life of a man and his wife and the generations following. And it's good to be reminded of God's promises to you and to me. These things aren't just out there for those people at that time. They're given then so that we can participate with them in God's goodness in our time and our place. He helps us in our presence, and he rewards us in our eternity. Great is thy faithfulness. You are known and fully known and fully loved by him. And we are invited to join him in what he's doing during this time, during this season. And his promises are yes and amen in Christ. And so it's good for us to remember those things. It's good for us to sing those, sing those things. It's good for us to remind each other of those things. And it's good to be together. So, amen? Amen. Thank you for leading us. And by the way, Miles is not here. This is his first time ever drumming on Sunday morning. So if you see Miles, did a great job. Great job. I told him, and I used to be a church drummer, by the way. I told him, hey, just worship as you do it. And Miles is a worshiper, so we're grateful that he was worshiping with us uh, again today. And thanks, of course, to Rob and the rest of the team. Okay, so we're dismissing the kids. Kids, you are free to roam about the country. So go ahead, go up here, <laughs> meet the people down there. You, hey, don't go too far, right? Don't go too far, of course. Yeah, thanks for that. But uh, we're glad that we have kids among us. And actually, in the prayer meeting this morning, I prayed for kids, or we prayed for kids, and said, God, thank you for giving us kids among us so that we can continue to pass down the legacy of faith that we've been received, uh, we've received, and passing it to other generations. So grateful for kids. Lots of kids are already downstairs as well as they're meeting, which is a beautiful thing. Okay, ready to go? We're jumping into this, okay? Go ahead, grab your Bibles, open up. We're going to Genesis, of course, and we're turning to chapter 15. We're going to tackle an entire chapter, okay? And we're going to see the story. And today in our passage, we're going to see God address this man, Abram, and address him in his fears. And as God speaks to him, he speaks to us in our fears, and he's specifically addressing fears for his help in this day during this life, and also fears for the life to come. And so as we go through this passage, and as we see God interacting with this man, Abram, I want you to continue to ask the question that we asked last week. And every time you read scripture, we have to ask what is true. Okay, what is true in this passage? What is true about us? What is true about God? What is being presented as truth? So we have to ask that question. God, what is true here? And look and investigate and pray for that. And then second, we are to ask now what to do. So we're looking for what is true, and then what to do from this passage. And again, sometimes it's to believe. Sometimes it's to change the way that we think. Sometimes it is to step these things out in our day in and day out lives. And so as you read scriptures and as we look at these scriptures, I want us to really look at what is true and what to do is not in the center. It's going to bother me. My OCD is coming out, okay? Right there. All right. So that's what we're looking at, okay? So here is our man, Abram. And if you've been tracking with us, right, we saw that God gave him promises, called out this man. And you can see how it fits in the entire story of the Bible. And by the way, our artwork now is up on the wall there. And this is something that I want us to think about Memorize as you think about the story of the Bible, not stories from the Bible, story of the Bible. And there's a difference, okay, that helps us. Creation and fall and restoration and redemption. This is what God is doing. Redemption, then restoration. And so God speaks to this man, Abram, calls him out and says, hey, 
follow me and go to the place that I will show you in the future. He didn't know it was based upon trust. And then God gave him some promises of what he would do to him. What would he do through him, as in make him a nation and bless him and to, and to curse those who dishonor him and bless those who bless him. And he will be a blessing to all of the nations of the world. And we see Abram as he takes this promise and steps out in faith with his family, going to a place he would not yet been. And in times of transition, God spoke to him personally and powerfully. And then we see him as he did well for a while. And then we see as he faced hardships, a severe famine, as in our lives, we face hardships and we face difficulties. He had a choice what he was going to do. He took matters into his own hands. He went down to Egypt. He lied about his relationship with his wife. He got into some trouble. And then God delivered him where he returned Back to the place of, again, worshiping God in the place that God called him to be. Aren't you glad that God gives his grace and gives us opportunities to return to him? So glad, right? And so we see that even in the patriarchs. We see that in the pages of the Bible, and it gives us hope for our life. It gives us hope for the lives of other people. And so then at that point, there was a separation between his nephew, and we see what's happening with Lot, and then Lot gets into greater trouble as these invading armies come in, take him, take the people of the land, rush them up north, and then Abram um, continues to see God's promises working in his life, goes in to see what God would do, rescues Lot, rescues these people, and then Lot goes to his place. He goes back to his place as Melchizedek, and we talked about that last week, a priest king blessed him, one who served the Lord, and Abraham blessed him back. So here we are. Now we're in chapter 15 looking at the story. And so this is how it starts. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 15 of Genesis. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Okay, let's pause, right? So after this, so after the things that we've read and heard about, we don't know how long after this was. It could have been the next day, which is kind of doubtful by the context. It could have been a month. It could have been uh, a year. But there had been some time, or years actually, there's been some time that elapsed that Abraham now was thinking, okay? He was thinking about what has taken place. For sure he was thinking of that. He was thinking about his future. And then he was thinking about his present. And when he was thinking about this, he started to become afraid. Will God help me now? And will God reward me for my continual following in him and obedience? Now, how do we know that Abram had these doubts? Because of what God says to him next. And this is our, our, our first major point. Do not be afraid. So Abram had seen God work. Abram had enjoyed God's promises. Abram had seen how he has been changing and transforming and God's grace and his goodness. And even in the midst of that, he had fears for his present and fears for his future, right? We as humans are prone to fear, and we can say amen to that, right? We have a concept about the future, but we don't know the contents of that future. So it makes us afraid. What's going to happen? Will I survive? How will I make it? Will my sacrifices and will my following after God be worth it? And we get into a headspace where we question things and wonder. And at times, we become uncertain or perhaps afraid. Even Abram was Afraid. So do not beat yourself up for being afraid at times, but trust God. Because you know what? God doesn't beat us up for being afraid, right? But he helps us and he encourages us and he comforts us and he tells us things that will be helpful for us. So here's our man Abram again, there in this land of promise and then He started to wonder, he started to question, and he started to worry about the people in the land, and he started to think about, well, will I have a child, and what will that look like? And then then God spoke to him, and aren't you grateful that God comes to us, right? 
Now, he does tell us to seek him, right? And he says that he is not far away from anyone. That's another promise, and that will help you if you feel far away. It'll help you when you think that your children are far away from God. The scripture says that he's not far away from anyone. If we just call out to him, he will be found by us. And there are times in which he pierces the darkness and speaks into our doubts and tells us and reassures us of his goodness. And I'm grateful for both of these things. And so here is Abram in this place, and he is camping out. He's thinking about God's promise. And God tells him in the second part of verse 1, Do not be Afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your very great reward. By the way, the number one command in Scripture is to not be afraid. You know that, right? Over and 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 over. Why is that necessary? Because we are prone to be scared, right? And when God tells us, and you can connect this and do this study, it's pretty fun. Every time you see God telling us not to be afraid, he gives us reasons why we shouldn't be afraid. And every reason is connected to his presence and his character. Because I am with you. Because I will be your shield. Because I am your great reward. Because I am. Remember that. It's not because of your strength. It's not because of your circumstances. It's not because of your power, but it's because of God's presence that we do not have to be afraid. Does that make sense? Okay. You always see that, so pay attention as you are reading Scripture on your own, which I trust that you are doing, that you will underline and seeing how is that connected. And it's always connected to God giving us more of himself, telling us what is true about him. So do not be afraid. Abram, God knows your name, right? He doesn't have royal amnesia. He hasn't forgotten about you. He knows you even better than the closest person in your life, even better than you know yourself, he knows us and continually calls us by name. We see this in Jesus where he says, I am the good shepherd, right? And I call my sheep individually, and he does, right? He doesn't say, hey, sheepy, sheepy, come on, right? Hey, you, you with the spotted coat, come on, right? Calls you by name. you by name. That should help us. Right? He speaks to us in our fear. He calls us by name. Hey, come here. Come here. Come here, Dave. I know you're scared. Here. Let me tell you a couple things here that's going to help you. And in this instance, God told Abram two things about himself that were to help him. Number one, I am your shield, Abram. I will protect you. That's what shields do, which tells us that he was fearful of those people who were in the land. Remember, he went to war, and probably he was thinking, what's going to happen now? Who's going to come out of the desert in the middle of the night? Who is going to protect me? So he had some fear about how he was going to make it through, how he will survive, how he could continue. God spoke into that fear and said, Abram, I want you to know that I am your shield. I am your help present. I will protect you, Abram. That's good news for him, and that is good news to us. God will protect protect us. Now again, that doesn't mean that everything is going to go peachy keen and all perfectly wonderful. 
It means that God will help protect you as you continue to persevere in his promises. You say amen right there, right? Persevere, overcome, opportunities to overcome. We see this again in every person's life that we read about in the Bible. Every person who continues to follow in faith and history and even to us. So God says, I am with you. I will be your shield. You will not be destroyed. You will continue to move forward. Even though there may be darts, even though there may be difficulties, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. That's good news, right? I am your shield, which points to him that he was questioning about his present help. And then also he says, I am your very great reward. Abram, I'm telling you, I know that you're afraid of wondering, hey, I left my family, I left my people, I left my country, I left my culture, and I did this to follow you. Will you honor your word, and will there be a reward in following you? The answer to that question is yes, there is. Just like you and us, right? It would have been easier for all of us just to stay home this morning, right? The gravity of the church of the inner spring, right? That was a joke. Come on. That's a mattress. You don't have any inner springs anymore. That's true, okay? It's an old joke. (laughs) You got up. You got your kids ready. You ate your breakfast. You got here. Sacrifice. You've given your time. You've given your talents. You've given your treasure. You've given up opportunities. You've given up things that seem to be fun in the moment, sinful things to say, I trust you for something better. And at times people wonder, is it worth following God? And people sometimes fall off the road. They say, you know what, this isn't worth it because it's too hard. And is it hard at times to follow God? Of course the answer is yes. But he... Is worth it along the way, and he will reward you in the end. Faith believes that. The essence of faith is believing that God exists, and he will reward those who seek him. Catch that word reward, and the reward so often is him. I am your very great reward in everything that comes with him. Nothing you do in the name of Christ will ever be lost. Be encouraged about that. When you look at your bills and like, God, I'm trying to honor you first with my money, okay? God, I trust you that the sacrifice is true. God, I trust you that reward will be good. And he helps us along the way. And he blesses us especially in the end. So our fears drive the question, God, will you help me now in this life? And that question is met with, I am your present help. And our fears and questions about the future, and we have them, what is to come, what will happen to me? It comes with, God will reward me. Will God reward me then? The answer is, I am your very great reward. So here's the line I want you to remember. You don't have to fear, because God will protect you now and reward you then. This makes sense? You do not have to fear, because God will protect you now. And also, he will reward you then. So trust God. Do not be afraid. So we're going to look at the second one first, because this is how Abram addresses this with God. So this is the next point. Trust God to reward you then. So here is Abram having this vision from God. God spoke to him at a time and place that he could understand. And this is the first time we see God, we see Abram interacting with God, right? Talking to him. 
every point up to this point, it was God speaking to Abram. And now Abram has a question for him. This is verse 2 of chapter 15 of Genesis. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, King who is all over all things, the ruler of everything, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I still remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You've given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Abraham struggled as to God's timing and how things will be fulfilled, right? <laughs> you ever struggle with that? Right? God's timing? How long, oh Lord? Right? I'm trusting you. How long will it take for restoration of my children, restoration of my marriage? How long, O oh Lord, will it take where I can abandon this tendency that is not honoring of you? God, how long? He says, well, I don't know how I trust you, but I don't know how it's going to be fulfilled. And God, what else can you do in my situation? And Abraham took stock of his present situation and said, well, God, you, you, know, you haven't given me a son, right? So he made an alternative plan in his strength and ability to pass on what he'd earn and accomplish to someone else because he didn't have a child of his own. Saying, my reward will be based on what I produce. Okay. It's not how it works in God's kingdom, but he had some questions. And by the way, God is not afraid of your questions. You can say amen to that. Right? How? When? God, I don't know, right? God listens, didn't rebuke him, helps him. Then the word of the Lord came to him in verse 4. Right? Abram, thank you for your plans. Thank you for submitting what you think is right. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, Abram. <laughs> thank you for your, your thoughts. This man, Eleazar, will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And that probably blew his mind at that point. The man nearing a hundred, his wife <laughs> nearing ninety. Abram, I know you haven't been able to conceive, but believe me, a son from your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then Abram undoubtedly was in a tent. He said, Abram, Abram, come come out here. Come here, come here, come here, come here. So he took him outside and said, All right, Abram, look up. Look up at the sky. And count the stars. Right? And it was blackety black black there, right? It wasn't like all these electric lights that we can hardly see. It was dark. And if you've ever been in a very dark place on a very clear night and you look up, it's like overwhelming. <gasps> what? Millions upon millions, countless stars. He says, Abram, let me give you a little um, demonstration, an illustration here. Look up at the sky and count the stars. Right? Mr. Smarty Pants, who thinks he knows what's going on. Right? Go count the stars, if you can, Abram. I can count them, Abram. <laughs> I know them all. Not only do I know them all, I know everything about every star, every planet, everything that exists, because I created it. Abram, go ahead, count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. So God's help for his reward, and he encourages us with this help for our reward in the future, saying, Listen, I know everything, I know the future, and when I tell you something, it's going to be fulfilled, and it is true. Right? That helps us saying it helps us. He says, Abram, it's not something produced from you, but someone produced through you will be your reward. Okay. And God's kingdom is not about your stuff. 
right? Do you know all of this stuff is going to be consumed in fire someday? Never done a funeral that was pulling a U-Haul trailer, right? A hearse. Never happens. You can't take it with you. But guess what? You can be what you can take with you. People. Right? The inheritance and the promise is to people and through people. So it's great that at the end of your life you have a big pile of cash. On the other side is pavements. Congratulations. Right? Golden streets. Right? But what can you take with you? It's people. So God, help us to use what we have to influence what is eternal. Right? Using our treasure, using our talents, using our time so that God will help us to connect with and see others, generations of those who come after us, be impacted and believe in the promises of God. Our reward is not something that's produced from us, but something that is produced through us because we are connected to the king. Does this make sense? Okay. So this is what he was telling him. Hey, there's going to be a child of a promise. Abram, look up. Trust me. In verse 6, this is a very theologically dense verse. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Circle that verse. Highlight that verse. This is significant. Abram had God's promise and his word to go on. Now again, this is the fourth time that Abram was told this, okay? And often we need to hear God's promises over and over and over and over again. That's one of the reasons why we gather together. That's one of the reasons why we read the word, that we can be reminded of the things we're so prone to forget. And so he believed the Lord. And in that belief, it was credited to Abram as righteousness. By the way, this is before Moses, remember Moses, leading the people out of Israel? Remember Moses, who received God's law? Remember Moses, who actually wrote the book of Genesis? Abram was declared righteous before God's law was given, which means... We are declared righteous not by our behavior, but by our belief. Okay. Come on, you got to catch this. Now, you might be saying, doesn't my behavior matter? It matters. Right? James is very clear that, hey, make sure that your faith is connected to your actions. Have you heard this phrase, faith without works is? But he says, talking about Abraham or Abram, his faith was completed by what he did, namely seen in his belief of when he put the promised child, okay? This is a spoiler alert, on the altar that he believed God even then that God could raise him from the dead. He never varied from his belief. We are declared righteous by believing in the righteous word of God, which is Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the righteous one. Does this make sense? Okay. Abraham believed God, and because he believed in God... God's word, God's promise for the future reward, God declared him righteous. The same is true to you and I. We are declared righteous because we believe in the righteous one, 
and our faith is evidence and made complete by following the righteous one, which is Christ in the obedience of faith. How can I say that this strongly? Because the Holy Spirit says it this strongly through the pen and preaching of the Apostle Paul. Go to Romans chapter 4, and I'd be amiss not bringing us to this passage at this point. Okay? Romans chapter 4, okay? Romans 4, 5, 6, 7 talks about this. As Paul is talking about the Old Testament Scripture, and the Holy Spirit is explaining to us what is written there. And this is what it says in Romans 4. Starting with verse 19. He, which was Abraham, he did not weaken in faith. Now we'll see that he continues to make missteps in trying to figure out how it happens. But he knew it was going to happen. So he, Abraham, did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. They were unable to have children. It was a no-go, a non-starter. They were continuing to get older and older. He did not weaken in his faith even when he considered himself and his condition physically and Sarah and her condition physically. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He believed God would do it. But... He, Abraham, grew strong in faith, okay? We talked about faith in his journey and us becoming mature, becoming more like Christ. He grew strong in his faith. As along the way, he glorified God, gave glory to God. He was, verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, okay? Are you seeing here? Okay. But the words, and this is the good news to us, so Paul is looking at Abram and saying, he was declared righteous because he believed God's promise to him, that there would be an heir, that there would be a reward. And then Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, says, but the words in verse 23 it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone. It was written for your sake as well. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, trespasses and raised for our our justification. Don't you like that? This concept of God speaking, God rewarding, God being with us in our return of trusting and believing and following when put together our belief is considered to us as righteousness. So when you die, you're not going to get to heaven. Hey, I'm here. Let me in. I deserve to be here because I am awesome. It's not going to go that way. By grace, you've been saved through faith. It's been by grace. Grace. God's. We have been declared righteous. Why? Through faith. Not by work, so none of us can boast. And so when God declared Abram, who was alive thousands of years before, the righteous one, the snake crusher, He believed God's promise, which was fulfilled in God's Son, and applied to us what was true of Him, righteousness, because we put our faith in Him. That's the gospel. And then God created us as His workmanship to do good works, which He selected beforehand that we should do. Our faith is completed by what we 
do. Our salvation is based on our belief. And our belief is evidenced by our lives. Amen, Pastor. Thank you. Now, do we do it perfectly? No. The issue is not if you fall down. The issue is, do you get back up? Get up. Keep walking. Keep believing. God will be faithful to his promises. And I have other verses and chapters and things in your notes. Go and look at them. So God speaking to Abram's fear speaks to our fear. Says, do not fear because I will reward you. Then trust in me, Abram, and trust in me all of my children. This is good news to us. Next and lastly, my last point. I have plenty of time. You're like, oh, Jesus, help us. Try to keep you awake. Trust God, right? Not just to reward you then, but to help you now. Help you now. So Abram believed God for this promise, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now God had some more things to speak to him, right? And so he says this in verse 7. He also said to him, Now I am the Lord, Abram, who thus far in your life, I brought you out of the land of Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land where you currently are and take possession of it. He reminded him, I'm giving you uh, nations and making you to be a blessing. I'm doing all this, and I told you that I'll give you a place as well. I'm giving you a promise. I'm giving you a place. Abram, you are now in this place. I want to remind you that I will give you this land. Verse 8, this is how Abram responds. But Abram said... Sovereign Lord, right? How can I know that I will gain possession of it? Now, if I was God, I'd probably roll my eyes at this point. Really? Come on, dude. Didn't you just say that you believed me based upon what I told you? You said I believe you. And then I tell you something else, you're like, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. Right? Aren't we sometimes the same way? Right? right? Come on. We believe God will save me in the end, but i got to go to work tomorrow. Can God help me tomorrow? Are you understanding this? Right? There's some things I think we more readily believe than others. Abram was the same way. <laughs> but God, do you understand all these people that are around here? <laughs> Sovereign Lord, yeah, he does. But, but God, you don't know how crabby my boss is. Really? God, you don't know how difficult my spouse is. I don't, do I? You, you hear yourself here? I hear myself. But God, but God, but God. I'm going to help you. Yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of it? And I love God's response. He doesn't chastise him. He doesn't say, all right, now go to your room and think about this, Abram. Right? What did I tell you? No, he doesn't say that. I'm grateful for God's loving kindness to us. <laughs> he says, all right, Abram. I know you're struggling with this, so let me help you. Verse 9. So the Lord said to him, All right, bring me a heifer, which is a calf for those non-farmers among us, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Bring these animals here. So Abram went out, gathered these animals, and brought them to him. He cut them in two and arranged the halves 
opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half, but he killed them, one here, one there. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham, Abram drove them away. Okay, what is happening here, right? We don't understand that because we're in, um, you know, New Testament context. We don't live in the ancient Near East. So this is what's happening there. And so at that time, in the ancient Near East, when a covenant agreement was going to be made between two parties, this is how they sealed it. They went out and they got a calf. Typically it was just one. We'll talk about that. And they slaughtered it, cut it in half. Boom. Got a bloody, gross mess. And then what would happen is that the two parties that are making the covenant, the promise, like I'm not going to injure you, or I promise that I'm going to sell you this land, or I agree, excuse me, <coughs> not to do this and that, okay? They would walk through these halves, okay? Getting the blood of the covenant on their feet. Is this ringing a bell? And what they were saying is, I covenant with you before God that if I do not keep my word to you, let me be like this animal. Talk about a visceral experience. You're seeing this animal cut in half. You're seeing the guts. You're seeing the blood. You're seeing that it's dead. We know that we could be cut in half as well. And so it was a pretty strong reminder. May this be unto me. May I be like this animal if I do not keep your my word to you. Wouldn't that be something if we did that at wedding ceremonies? You guys are like, disgusting. Right? But it would make people think twice about breaking their covenant, yo. Are you understanding this? That's what they did, right? So this is what's happening. So God said, all right, I'm going to talk to you in a language and it's something you can understand. Not only do I want you to go get a calf, Abraham, but go get a goat as well. What else did he drag here? Let's see. <laughs> goat, a, a cow, a ram. I'm going to make this triply so, quadruply so. And by, all, by, by the way, all of these things, you can see these things. It's part of the sacrificial system. They're all clean animals. We see the blood of the covenant. Abram, go do this. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you a sign that you can trust me. Verse 12, so what happens? So these animals were here. Abram waited. These other birds of prey were coming down. They're here, this bloody mess. As the sun was setting, verse 12, Abram fell into a deep sleep. And a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. It got very, very, very dark. Then the Lord said to him, Abram, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your very descendant, Abram, will come back here. For the sins of the Amorites have not yet reached its full measure. Lots of things here. Okay. I'm going to pull out just a couple. So God's 
was speaking to him. The covenant had been set up. He was waiting. It got very dark, so it would be very obvious to him what was going to take place. And these promises about the future also helped Abram to know that he will have descendants, but it also helped the Israelites, as they were wandering through the desert, as Moses, come on, remind, remind yourself of this, was writing these things, saying, hey, people of Israel, God knew you were going to be there in Egypt. He actually knew that we were going to be there for 400 years. The sovereign God who was sovereign to Abram allowed difficulties to happen so his will will be done. Hello, right? Same in our lives. He still, even though it's difficult, doesn't mean God's not working. His delay is not his denial. Trust me. Trust me. I'm still working I know what's going to happen. Trust me that nothing will thwart my plan on this earth, and nothing will thwart my plan for you. And so these things happen. Abraham heard these stunning things, which means that God will help him, not just now, but these descendants. Verse 17, when the sun had set again and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared, passing between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenizzites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephraites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. I know these people are in the land, but I'm giving this to you. Now what I love about this, who passed between the animals? God did. He says, Abram, I don't need you for this covenant because I am making it on my own. We can trust this God who makes a covenant to us not based upon our goodness, but based upon His. I will help you. Now I will reward you then. So here's the conclusion, and we're going to go to communion. If you're at home, go grab your communion elements. That would be great. This is what I want us to remember. You don't have to fear. And you can personalize this. I do not have to fear. Why? Because God will protect me now. He will be with you. He will not abandon you. And also, he will reward me then. So great will be your reward. So if you are struggling with fear, if you are struggling with anxiety, and of course there are people here who are doing that even right now, what about, what if, I don't know. Here's a response. Trust him. He is going to be true to his word and he'll be true to you. Believe him. Believe in Christ for your eternal reward and continue to hold on to his promises as we wait for them all to be completely fulfilled to us. And so we are going to observe another covenant, another promise, a new covenant in my blood. Sound familiar? <laughs> We do that through communion, and we're going to observe it in just a moment, but I'm going to pray for us first as we transition to that direction. God, again, thank you for your word this morning. 
Thank you that we have recorded rightfully, truly, about events that were scripted by you that give us hope, give us encouragement, and give us strength to continue to hold on to your promises in our day. God, we thank you for the faith of Abram. We thank you that you changed his name to Abraham, the father of many nations. And God, we're thankful that you said that in your word, that if we have the faith of Abraham, we are children of Abraham. And the promises to him now are given to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Who was... crucified for our transgression and who was raised for our justification. We thank you for the covenant that you made in your blood. And Jesus, we say we believe in you. Thank you for the reward that is yet to come. And God, thank you for your spirit that helps us now. And God, I pray for my friends in this room that you will help us when we have fear. Where am I going to live next? Where am I going to go? What's going to happen? How would my bills get paid? And on and on and on, all of these things. God, thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So great is your faithfulness. Thank you for that, God. And God, help us to remember also that we, what we've entrusted to you, what we believe in you, God, said that you will watch over it, that you would give us your reward. We're grateful for that. So we, God, we stand in faith. Strengthen us. Encourage us, and thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name.